So uh, while our stomachs are analyzing the conference lunch, excellent conference lunch, and deriving nutrients from it, we will see what PostgreSQL has in store for analytics, which is a hot topic today. I mean, I'm, the conference that we had last year and the conference that we are having this year is very different. It feels like an AI conference to this year rather than a PostgreSQL conference. And a part of um, what drives AI is analytics. So I want to step back a little bit and talk about how PostgreSQL, um, what is the role of PostgreSQL in this world of analytics? So what is um, data analysis? Data analysis uh, is the process of inspecting, cleansing, transforming, and modeling data with the goal of discovering useful information. The useful information is basically data insights. For example, if um, they look at the uh, food orders that have been placed in this hotel for last two or three days, they would know what PostgreSQL community likes. That's an insight that they can get from the individual orders, uh, the data for individual orders. So that, um, so get useful information, informing conclusions, and then support, supporting decision making. So for that, we have to start from what data we want to analyze. What it look, I mean, what kind of data is, what, what the arena looks like. I will classify this data into three categories, chiefly from PostgreSQL's point of view, not necessarily data, point, data but PostgreSQL's point of view. Um, first category is the data which is generated in PostgreSQL systems. The PostgreSQL systems which are being used for um, transactional purposes as systems of record, the data that gets generated there. The second category is the data which is PostgreSQL friendly. Data which has some way of representing in PostgreSQL, which PostgreSQL can read, interpret, um, query, deal with, and so on. Um, that's like the relational data in other database systems, other OLTP systems, or JSON, um, data in Hadoop clusters, log files, and so on. There, there, there are many things in this category. And then the third uh, category is data which is right now uh, hard for PostgreSQL to understand, analyze, even store, which is like videos, images, event streams that are generated uh, on social media platform, audio streams, all of that data. Uh, but well, as I'm saying it, somebody might be writing an extension which will allow PostgreSQL to analyze videos as well. So um, I don't know how, how long even that category will remain as a separate category, but let's, let's categorize it in these three things. For us, the first two categories are important. The data which is generated by PostgreSQL or which is sitting in PostgreSQL systems or the data which is friendlier. So let's start from the first category um, and see what makes PostgreSQL uh, an attractive solution for the data which sits in PostgreSQL system itself. Um, again, I will classify these capabilities into three different categories. One is querying capabilities. The rich SQL constructs that PostgreSQL supports um, for example, window functions, city, different kinds of joins. Full text search is one category where PostgreSQL is kind of leading uh, in the relational databases. This may not surprise people who are using PostgreSQL day to day, but those who come from the purely analytical systems, no SQL data, they are surprised by the capabilities that PostgreSQL offers. And this is a re really rich set. And we will, at the end of presentation, we'll see how this, uh, this set of capabilities is helping PostgreSQL to stand in the world of analytics. 
just having SQL con constructs does not help. A lot of data needs to be analyzed. A lot of data needs to be queried. And it needs to be queried faster, almost real time. So the second category or second class of the capabilities is the performance features which help PostgreSQL um, run queries very fast on, on the data that it has. And some of these uh, capabilities have been um, developed, added re um, over the years. For example, JIT, uh, which is just-in-time compilation, which allows um, the SQL expressions or SQL constructs to be executed as a program rather than interpreted for every row that comes in, which makes the queries much faster. Parallel query allows um, multiple backends to be used to execute a single query, thus allowing um, scaling, uh, I mean, I would say vertical scaling. Then there are special indexes which are um, specialized in analytical workloads like Brin, Gin, Gist, Hash, which um, allow these queries to be faster. And last but not the least, materialized view. There was a presentation specifically for materialized views. Um, and a typical use case in analytical workloads is caching, where the materialized, used, uh, materialized views are used as cache, either for foreign data or the data native to PostgreSQL, where um, already analyzed data or already analyzed results are saved and then refreshed uh, and then queried directly. Um, so those two things uh, make PostgreSQL attractive for analytics, but having both of these workloads, OLAP as well as OLTP, run on same same physical system, isn't desirable um, because these loads affect each other. They are usually conflicting, and so um, a typical deployment is there. These two systems are segregated. There is OLTP system for transactional, and then there is OLAP system, which is for the analytical load. In both cases, um, the software is still PostgreSQL. The RDBMS that is used is still PostgreSQL, but the underlying architecture, um, uh, uh, the physical representation of data, the indexes that are created, the column layout, objects that are in both these systems are different. And what helps um, maintaining these systems in consistent manner is the third category of capabilities, the third set of, the se uh, set of features, which I call as migration features. Uh, they are not labeled as such when you look at them, but they basically um, replace simple ETL systems, where the data from transactional system can be replicated or migrated to data in the OLAP system. Just a minute. Now, um, I have added physical replication there, but physical replication is um, no more so much attractive. What's more attractive is logical replication, which can handle different logical views that these systems present. And looking at the way logical um, replication is being developed and it's improving in PostgreSQL, um, it's quite possible that more and more ETL systems will be replaced by systems which are based on logical replication. And third, uh, feed, and by the way, quite a lot of logical replication work today happens from India. So um, that's, that's something to note uh, in this conference. FDW is, the, is um, a way for foreign data to be represented in PostgreSQL, and we'll see more, of, more use of it. But it also allows the data um, from different systems to be accessible on analytical system. So that's, that, again, I have added that as a feature in the migration capability, where the data which is right now there in OLTP system, if we need to analyze it, FDW can be used for the re real-time analytics and can, um, that data can be accessed even before it goes through the logical replication and takes, uh, or through ETL system and is available for OLAP system. So, 
So that is uh, really what makes PostgreSQL attractive for analyzing the data that it has and analyzing the data at the edge. If, even if both of these, uh, le I mean consider that both of these systems are sitting um, right at the edge where the data is produced. But um, often what, what is seen is the data that needs to be analyzed is not on a single system. It is on, <coughs> it is spread across <coughs> multiple systems and um, combined data is quite a lot. I mean, the data on one system and such 10 systems, when it is combined, aggregated into a single system, it becomes quite a lot. And um, that's where just using PostgreSQL kind of becomes difficult. And um, that's where the first um, architecture for analytical system comes into picture, which is data warehouse. But before going that, uh, if there are any questions, I would Uh, how many storages? Um, well, this, this shows just one copy, but there can be multiple copies of it depending upon the scale or the kind of analytics is run. Um, for different analytical applications, we can set up different, I mean, one, let's say, one PostgreSQL for each analytical application as well through this architecture. Instances of PostgreSQL. No, no, no. These are separate systems. There is, um, there is nothing shared between uh, these systems. Well, unless it is Aurora, but that's a different story. Any other question? So what, um, what I'm going to do in this talk is I'm going to uh, discuss the evolution of analytical systems along with uh, how PostgreSQL has been coping up with the challenges that come uh, as these architecture have evolved. So um, there are three architectures, uh, three main architectures that have come up in analytical systems. And the very first and oldest architecture is data warehouse, where um, as we saw that there are these systems on the edge, transactional systems, and the data is aggregated into a single system. That's what is data warehouse, where on the left-hand side we have data sources, which uh, the data from those is extracted, transformed, and then loaded into data warehouse, or extracted, loaded, and then transformed. But ultimately, it goes into data warehouse. And from that data warehouse, uh, it again can be exported into application-specific data marts. So you will see that there are multiple stages where the data um, goes through different ingestion and ingestion pipelines and then again outgoing pipelines. But, uh, and then the reporting, BI, data visualization, all those applications work on, work on the data warehouse. Given the sheer amount of data that goes into data warehouse, um, it requires very different capabilities. For example, the data needs to be stored in columnar storage so that um, compression, I mean, the data can be compressed. It goes into columnar store so that it's efficient to just fetch the columns, required columns, and filter the rows out. It requires massive parallel uh, MPP, massively parallel processing, which is basically employing multiple nodes, multiple query nodes, which we, 
with each node uh, given a set of data that, that is analyzed and then aggregating the data. And the third capability is vectorized processing engines where um, a, well, a simple example is SIMD architecture, but basically the idea is to uh, process multiple rows or multiple data points at a, sing, uh, at a time rather than the usual volcano model that PostgreSQL has where a single row goes all the way up, then the second and third. Now these technologies are very different from what PostgreSQL has. And um, unfortunately, we, uh, well, for, for the reasons of architecture, PostgreSQL never developed these capabilities inside PostgreSQL. So if you just take the stock PostgreSQL, it does not come up, uh, c come with all these facilities. So if we want to use PostgreSQL, we either have to go to derive DBMSS, and Greenplum is a very good example of a data warehouse which has PostgreSQL at its heart. In fact, it, it uses a lot of PostgreSQL code. Or we have to go to extensions like Citus DB, Timescale DB, which can be dropped onto the stock PostgreSQL, and then the system behaves as is, uh, as a data warehouse. Um, again, I, I have not listed all the examples, and the, the, even within the, this set, the capabilities differ. Like Netiza has a different approach, Greenplum has a different approach. Uh, I was part of Postgres XE, um, which then had many derivatives of its own. It was a system that we developed for OLTP workloads to get linear scalability, but it was also used for uh, data warehousing, even though it did not have a columnar store. It, it did employ the MPP, though. So when we come to um, the data warehousing, we have to go to this derived DB, uh, DBMSS and extensions. But what... Um, of course, uh, the, the data warehouses had their own challenges. Because they built uh, this, these special technologies for storing and processing data, they were expensive and um, massive. So they required, so basically the challenges can be again classified into three categories. The first was they required ingestion pipelines, ingestion pipelines to get the data into data warehouse and then put it out into um, out into the solutions or other data marts, and that added delay. Uh, no more they were useful for the real time analytics, the data analyzing the data while it was being generated. By the time it, the data could be analyzed, it would become stale. The results that it would give may not be useful. While the data got loaded into data warehouse, it, it often required conversion and uh, manipulation of the data, which meant that the data that was in data warehouse was always, I mean, it might end up being doubtful. After, let's say, one or two years, the anal analyst might think that, okay, whether this is really what the original data was or whether I can use the same data, whether the inferences that I will create from this data are go would have been same as what I would get from original data. Always that doubt um, arose. So these data conversion and pipelines impacted quality and then failures. I mean, uh, we know as many, as much, as many serial components as we add in the pipeline, the failure rate increases, and that's what uh, happens with the data warehouse as well. Most of these data warehouses um, were RDBMS. They were SQL-based databases, which means that, uh, or they are, in fact, today SQL-based databases. They had, um, they could analyze structured data to some extent semi-structured data, <coughs> but certainly unstructured data was out of the ream. Um, so if, I mean, going back to the first uh, 
slide, we see that so much of variety of data that needs to be analyzed today, data warehouses, um, well, they, they fail short of it. The third is uh, data access. Because this data is so, these systems are so precious that the data that goes into data warehouses is carefully scrutinized to decide whether this, whether this column goes into data warehouse or not, whether this row goes into data warehouse or not. And um, since it's precious, nobody, like, not anybody is allowed to go and start experimenting with that system. The queries are carefully crafted, their uh, performance is analyzed, tune, everything. So once the data goes into data warehouse, it's no more, um, it lacks that experimental touch that today's data scientists want. The today's data scientists want like, okay, if I model it this way, would I get better results? Can I change my parameters this way in the query and will I get better results? And so on. Um, all that experimental touch is gone um, from because of the limited data access. Uh, any questions till this point about data warehouse? Again, so something you know that that is not part of uh, that was not part of native PostgreSQL, uh, but possible with derived systems. Okay, so data warehouses were on the f on one extreme of the spectrum structured data, relational data, precious data, um, everything carefully crafted. As a result of these challenges, we went to the other extreme where we started the, the architecture of data lakes, where, as you see, any kind of data would be dumped into the data lake, just like water from, uh, I mean, a uh, lake which contains water can receive water from many sources, streams, underground, overground, rains, uh, connected rivers. Similarly, a data lake can have, can contain data from any source. It does not need to have any schema. It is raw. And um, since it does not require any schema, a la large variety of data can be part of the data lake. And usually, uh, this, is, this was possible because of the cheap and highly scalable storage available in the form of object store, in, especially in cloud, where it wouldn't matter whether you dump GBs of data, TBs of data, as compared to, let's say, data warehouses. Um, another important thing here is the, this data is usually in open data formats, which means that no more it is in, let's say, in, if we talk about PostgreSQL, it's no more in the heap format, which only PostgreSQL understands. It's an open data format, Parquet, so uh, whose standards are published. There are libraries which can read Parquet format, and so anybody can write a program which, uh, which, which can read this uh, data. So, um, this also allowed storage and compute to be separated which means that both of them can be um, scaled up and down separately. Um, so compute can be added as required or removed as required. Storage can be added as required, removed as required. And the last uh, but not least, this led to democratization and decentralization of data. We, it, it was no more um, one particular set of people uh, which could access this data. Or you, do, you, do, you don't have to go through, data scientists don't have to go through a part, approval, set of approvals and uh, requests to their IT team or SQL team to fetch the d data and results. They can, um, they can be, like, the data lake can be managed in such a way that they also can have access to data. But uh, in order to, um, 
make sure that the right data reaches right people, it is divided into zones uh, like landing, gold, work, sensitive data. Um, again, depending upon what data lake use you have, these zones also vary. And then decentralization because um, no more it's the same system. No more it's a single data warehousing system that is accessing and analyzing the data. Uh, one can choose the system of their need, uh, which basically satisfies their need to uh, do this. Well, Data Lake, since it was other extreme, had their own challenges. So they didn't have transactional consistency. For example, the, the data while it is being ingested can mix into the data which is already there in the data lake and the query cannot really decide whether the data that is being read is consistent with the rest of the data or not. Um, so, I mean, rather than transactional consistency, we could actually say it lacked ACID properties. The, all the comforts that ACID gives um, us were lacking in the data uh, lake. Similarly, the SQL capabilities um, like rich query language, indexes, statistics, all of that missing, or missing at least, or it needs to be created in, um, it is not managed by that system. One has to go create, write programs to do all of this if they require it. And still, uh, if we go back, we require some kind of ETL. There, there is data warehouse sitting there, if, if you observe. Because the traditional applications are still SQL compliant. They still need SQL. So the data needs to go to data warehouse from which these applications can um, read. Governance, auditing. So most of the things that the relational databases give or have uh, developed over the years, data lakes, uh, they all were missed there. And you will also see that here, I mean, in data, when we discuss data warehouse, we at least discuss the deri derived products based on PostgreSQL. But when it came to data lake, uh, PostgreSQL was almost missing, except maybe that data warehouse block, which is there. Um, solution to that was, so, Data warehouses started from one end of spectrum, data lake on the other end of spectrum. What is happening right now is a confluence of these two technologies. Um, relational databases or relational data warehouses are trying to um, develop the capabilities which are there in data lake right now. And the data lakes are trying to build the capacities that are there in um, uh, that are there in the relational system. So there is a confluence happening which leads to data lake house kind of system. But before that, any questions on discussion so far? Yeah, I, I'll come to that. I, I'll come to, I, I will explain the data lake house and then the, we'll come to the role that PostgreSQL is playing there. Um, okay, so with Data Lake House, it combines um, best capabilities from both the worlds. So from Data Lake, we maintain the storage computation separation, cheap objects to our democratize and decentralized data. The data is still in open data formats. And from Data Warehouse, we take the transactional con consistency and um, SQL compliant APIs which is typically um, done by an architecture like this, where the data lake, the data is still stored as if it was in data lake, but on top of it, there is a layer which provides the metadata APIs, which, which means, um, I mean, it, it includes even the indexes and statistics about the data. Um, it provides transaction management, government, governance, versioning, auditing, all of that. 
Um, and then that layer exposes uh, APIs, which are either in the form of SQL APIs or the data frame APIs, which are um, then used by data scientists. At, um, so typically, there are two approaches. So this middle layer is important and which basically brings the both, best of both worlds together. And there are two approaches to this middle layer. One is um, the approach that, uh, for example, systems like Hive take, where they have a meta store which holds all this information, and at the heart of the meta store is a relational system. And very typically, PostgreSQL system, because it is open source, um, available, works out of the box. So they deploy a relational database system uh, at the heart of meta store, which basically exposes, the, um, exposes all these APIs. A recent trend is, uh, I mean, the problem with that is the data gets analyzed blazingly fast because of all the map reduce capabilities um, and, and all, the, all the capabilities of that query engine, but the metadata APIs take longer because they have that extra step of going to an RDBMS, fetching metadata from there, and then deciding what data and how to analyze. So the other approach, which is a recent approach, not even, I mean, four or five years it has been since it's being developed, is to save that data right in the data lake. So this metadata governance, um, all of that goes into the data lake. And the standards like Iceberg, Hudi, Delta Lake are being developed there. They are not uh, as mature as the relational databases. So again, um, there is, there is still something desired from the relational databases and they are not completely being replaced. However, in, in uh, Lake, no. Oh, for metadata, usually the metadata um, is, is way smaller than uh, the data that is in the lake. And that, I mean, we, we have now, now transactional systems which um, store and process terabytes of data with relational databases. So metadata is never at that point. I mean, metadata has not reached that point. So there are no limitations as such on that. The, I think the only limitation is the latency that, that it adds and some of the layers, so this layer architecture that there is a layer of meta store. The meta store is also not single layer. It is um, usually some uh, connector component, some object uh, relational conver converter there. So all of those layers add the latency. What is, um, but what this forgets, um, this kind of system which puts the relational database or PostgreSQL at the store of Metastore or this middle layer is the very first slide that we saw. That PostgreSQL or good RDBMSs themselves have many capabilities which are enough to expose the SQL APIs. And uh, we will see with PostgreSQL there is something more that it exposes. So um, if we do that, then all the problems that these systems have with Metastore, the latency, the layers and stages um, can be eliminated. with a system like this. But before coming to this system, um, I will again go back to the capabilities of PostgreSQL, something that uh, again have been built very recently and which um, are often ignored uh, when we think about PostgreSQL as analytical databases. So we saw data variety is something that is desirable by the latest systems of analytics. PostgreSQL addresses it by its own rich 
built-in data type system. We, I mean, we have JSON, which has been there for quite some time. But PostgreSQL's real strength comes from its extensibility. It, um, it no more constrains its users by its own limitations. Everything in PostgreSQL is extensible, including the data type, storage, what data it can access, um, execution engine, planner, everything is extensible. And the way to exploit those extensions is through, um, is, is through the extensions, the PostgreSQL extensions, by, which basically plug into these hooks. Um, a very good example, which is being discussed uh, in and out in this conference is PG Vector. Uh, there are so many uh, talks and trainings which were around PG Vector, which is a data type added by an extension, PG Vector extension. So um, that's a very good example of how PostgreSQL, core PostgreSQL can be extended for analytical capabilities. In terms of data sources, uh, foreign data wrappers I mentioned earlier, um, and almost for any kind of data, there is a data wrapper available. Um, uh, I remember a talk uh, by Jim, uh, I don't know whether he's here, we just listed all the um, external sources that can be accessed through foreign data wrappers, and we, this was long back, which included a web uh, and whatnot. I mean, the, even I think there, there is a foreign data wrapper for Twitter event stream. Recent uh, addition to this is table access method, where even the underlying storage can be changed. And um, there are um, table access methods which allow the data to be stored in columnar storage as if it's native to PostgreSQL. And we'll see one example of it. Um, well, horizontal scaling is again something old, but it allows um, scaling horizontally. Caching we talked about. And the last is even the languages, stored procedure languages are extensible. The PLPG SQL is uh, by default there, SQL is default, but we can add PLR, PL Python, the languages which data scientists know about, which they use day in and day out. Stored procedures written in those languages can become part of the uh, part of PostgreSQL itself. So it just takes away many limitations that we will use with the typical relational databases. And this allows um, PostgreSQL to be almost an end-to-end -end solution in the data lake. Again, not, I'm not saying that it is the solution, but it is one of the significant solutions that can be deployed in a data lake. And that's where you know, data lake being decentralized and democratic uh, helps. Where, again, the data sits in data lake in open data format. There are zones. Um, on, but that data is analyzed by a columnar query engine, like Data Fusion, which can be plugged into PostgreSQL's executor. So, the, so when PostgreSQL senses that this data is not the native data and it's in columnar format, the query is redirected or the execution is redirected to the columnar query engine. PostgreSQL still takes care of the transaction management, governance, auditing. Um, and this ties into the storage through the columnar store, um, which is implemented through table access method. And then PostgreSQL itself exposes the SQL APIs. So PostgreSQL here has two functions. One, it delegates, basically uh, gives the middle layer that we saw in Data Lake House as well as the SQL APIs. And it also takes responsibility of those SQL APIs. Anything which columnar query engine cannot handle, there is PostgreSQL to handle it. So no query, I mean, it never happens that you want to fire a query and the underlying engine is not supporting it. Planner cannot plan for that query. All of that is taken care by PostgreSQL. It might not be as efficient, but you get your results. Um, 
And then, um, uh, so this happens through the FDW um, interface or table access method interface. Uh, the horizontal line there shows that the PostgreSQL itself can scale. The PostgreSQL layer can itself scale using logical replication, which allows this metadata that PostgreSQL is maintaining into multiple of PostgreSQL instances. And each of these instances is cap capable of uh, serving the queries. Again, adding columnar query engines in a pool and scaling even that layer further. Ah, okay. <laughs> no, that, that um, represent, this is representation of a data lake, but um, as I said in the f very first slide, that some of that data is not yet, I mean, PostgreSQL, I would say, I wouldn't dare to say that PostgreSQL is not capable of dealing with that data because things are changing fast, but it is hard. So there is some data that will remain out of in the data lake, which, is, which will remain out of PostgreSQL's um, access or PostgreSQL's capabilities. Um, but, uh, but that data then offers, um, it can be analyzed by other means or the embeddings that will be created, the information that will be extracted from that data goes into PostgreSQL and analyzed there. Um, I will skip this example, but I will give example of Parade DB. This is not hypothetical. The, the architecture that I have been uh, showing here is not hy hypothetical. There is Parade DB which um, adds these capabilities it, it, through a drop in extension of PG Analytics, takes stock pro Postgres, add this extension, and you get all these capabilities which allow um, analytical queries to be run on Postgres SQL instance. Uh, they claim that it, it gives 94x speed up compared to stock PostgreSQL and then 5x data compression. Um, last but not least, Enterprise DB is not uh, behind in this game. Um, we are developing a system, a single system which can um, provide transactional, analytical, and AI uh, capabilities all under a single pane of glass. So stay tuned uh, for Enterprise DB's capabilities. With that, uh, I will end my presentation and we'll open for questions. Raila, do we have time for questions? Do we have time for questions? Yeah, we do have. Okay. We do have time for questions if there are any questions. Uh, sir, could you please explain uh, the use case of Apache Arrow that uh, you showed uh, in the slide, oh, okay. previous slide? Um, yeah. yeah. There. No, next, next. Yeah, the yeah. Apache Arrow. So, um, and the Apache Data Fusion as well, that, that would also help. So what it does is um, it has a table access method which can access Parquet files and uses Apache Arrow for uh, storing that data in memory. So Arrow, I think, uh, has, um, I think it's a standard or capability by which the columnar data can be stored, can be, uh, brought in memory and stored in columnar format and then further it can be analyzed by the columnar query engine. So for storage it uses Parquet and the data that gets analyzed is in the form of arrow. Uh, if there are no more questions, we'll end this presentation and uh, move on to the next one. If you have any other questions, please feel free to connect to Ashutosh offline.